The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Dr. Perez grew up in Texas in Beeville, which I was trying to think of a Beeville joke, uh, but all I could come up with was uh, the name Aville was already taken, so they could Beeville. It's pro probably true. It's probably true. Probably yeah. Too. Yeah. Or else maybe it has some biological connection with bees. No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, then she came to TLU as an undergraduate, just like you all here, and uh, finished here her Bachelor of Science degree in Molecular Biology. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, she was accepted into grad school, and she went to the PhD program at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, which is the medical school there. And she was in the Department of Cellular and Structural Biology. And that's where she did the work that she's going to talk about uh, today. Uh, she taught at another school for one year, and then uh, she came here and interviewed last year, and she blew away the competition, Yay. definitely. And we hired That's great. Her, and so now she's here teaching <laughs> microbiology and human anatomy and physiology this semester. So maybe you try to work in those classes. Yeah. So she's going to talk about uh, her research so that we can better understand what she's done in the past and what her background is in that research, and it's pretty exciting research, too. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's I brought my cheat sheet with me because I can't remember statistics very well. So I'm just warning y'all ahead of time. Um, so I like this phrase. Uh, I thought it was nice that um, you don't always want to be a product of your environment, right? I want my environment to be a product of me. And sometimes even cells wish that. Um, because sometimes they can be, oftentimes, they're influenced by the cells that are around them, although they would prefer not to be. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the, the environment, and I call it the microenvironment because we're talking about a really small scale environment, how the environment in the bone marrow can affect normal blood cells and convert them or influence them to change into starting to produce a disease-like state. And so um, I actually have this image in, it, there's four of them. My uh, mentor in graduate school, after I graduated, or defect, correctly defended my dis dissertation, <laughs> uh, took pictures of the cells that I grew and gave them, gave them to me as a present. So I have them framed in my office. So if you're ever wanting to see them, you can. And I told my AMP class if they showed up today, they would see a live adipocyte. And these are live odipocytes. And you can see them. Right here's the nucleus. And then here are the globules of, of fat triglycerides right, that are accumulating, so you can actually see them. All right, so before um, I get into the nitty gritty details, the, the specific disease that I studied to see if the environment was playing a role in it was called um, MDS, which stands for myelodysplastic syndrome. And as you all know in biology, um, if we look at the root words or the prefixes and suffixes of the terms, we can figure out exactly what it means. And so Milo refers to the bone marrow. And when we talk about dysplasia or dysplastic, it's referring to abnormal growth um, or development of cells. And so this disease is associated with abnormal growth and development of cells in the bone marrow. Now, it's a really heterogeneous group of disorders. It's not just uh, characterized by one phenotype and that's it. They kind of have all of these different pheno phenotypes, but ultimately they have disruption um, in the development of the cells. Now, if you think way back to a very early class in biology, you probably learned about the blood system. And there is a master cell um, for the blood, which is the hemopoietic stem cell. This is a cell that gives rise to all of your blood cells, and it lives in the bone marrow. And um, so it produces mature cells, and then those mature cells migrate out to the blood. And this um, hemopoietic stem cell in myelodysplastic syndrome isn't uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Um, it actually decreases in numbers, and because it decreases in numbers, it can't produce the appropriate amount of mature cells um, that are needed for you to do your normal function like fight, immune, fight um, infections um, and, and perform the normal functions of blood. 
Now, this is kind of a, a, a high statistic for a lot of diseases now. Um, we've narrowed this down in a lot of diseases to really low numbers, um, but this is the survival rate for people who have MDS. Um, now realize it's a heterogeneous group, so this is an average of all of the different types of MDS. So the survival rate is between 20 and 40 percent. Even with modern technology, it's still really high. And so we want to understand myelodysplastic syndrome and hopefully develop treatments to reduce this number. Or increase the number, right? We want, <laughs> we want more survivors, of course. Okay. So, um, now, often MDS is characterized as a pre-leukemic disorder, right? and it's called a pre-leukemic disorder because often if you have MDS, it transitions into a leukemia, and not all cases, um, but it does in about 30% of humans who have MDS and survive MDS, then they can get um, they could potentially get um, a leukemia. And the specific type of leukemia is AML, which is um, acute myelogeno myelogenous leukemia, which affects the myeloid cells of the blood. Now, so this rate is really, um, the survival rate is low, and if you survive MDS, then you also have a chance of getting leukemia and dying from that, right? So overall, it's not good. And so what we're trying to do is understand it a little bit more. Now, who gets MDS? And overall, about 70% of the people with MDS are elderly. That means that they're over the age of 60. And so it is related to, uh, to mutations that accumulate with age in your DNA. But there's another group um, of uh, people who acquire MDS, which are after they have been treated with a cancer that was not related to the blood at all, let's say they had um, a tumor in, on, on their breast or a tumor in the lung, right, or a brain tumor. They're, if they are treated with specific types of chemotherapy and then they survive that cancer, some will potentially develop MDS afterwards. So how tragic is that? You go through this horrible treatment to survive um, from a primary tumor and then you develop a secondary disease after caused by the treatment um, that was trying to help you survive, right? And so that's really um, a tragic case. And this often happens in children. Um, and then there is also um, exposure, environmental exposures that can cause an increased incidence um, for benzene, I mean for MDS, and benzene is one of those. Um, benzene is, um, you can get exposure to benzene from gasoline, uh, you can get exposure from benzene from smoking. Um, also, in, in the yeah, I'm looking at some of my students who smoke. <laughs> and um, also, in the petroleum industry, um, levels of benzene are much higher. And so, often people in the petroleum industries, oil, gas, have to use uh, masks that protect them uh, from this gas. Now, this is just a, a study to show it. Um, this is re referring to the odds ratio. How likely is this correlated with benzene exposure, MDS? And this odds ratio, if it's one, it suggests that there's no association. Basically, you can be exposed as much benzene as you want and you'll never get MDS. This is extremely high. It's, on the, it's four times higher than one. And so there's a, there's a, a very large correlation uh, between benzene exposure and the development of MDS. So I just wanted to give you another, one example. And so from all of this, what we wanted to know uh, was if we want to understand MDS, first we have to have a model to, to be able to study it and to potentially um, test treatments. Now we can't do that in humans uh, for ethical reasons and we don't want to test out drugs on humans that we don't, we're not sure exactly work. And so we had to have a model for this, and most of the time when we were doing research, models are mice. Um, they're very similar to humans at the genetic level, and so they have many of the same proteins produced that we do. And so uh, what we were looking at is a mouse 
that has different levels of a gene called CREBP. It's, I call it CBP for short because, um, because I can't stand to say that a thousand times. So, <laughs> so I call it CBP, and that was its original name at the beginning. So we had um, developed several different mice, and we had a mouse that was, had both copies of CBP, which you would expect, right, in humans and in mammals, for most mammals, where we have two copies of each one of our chromosomes. We're all diploid, right? two copies of each one of our chromosomes. So we should have two copies of uh, all of our genes, unless we have a problem, right? And so here, this mice has two copies of its CBP gene. And it's perfectly fine, right? It'd be a perfectly healthy uh, mouse, and it is. It's perfectly healthy. Um, and then we had a mouse that had lost one copy, and we engineered it so that it would happen this way, right, where one is deleted and one stays intact. And so it only has one copy of the CBP gene. And then there are also, uh, we tried to develop mice that had no copies of the CBP gene. That means no CBP protein would be ever, right, uh, translated. And so this mouse actually had about half, if we took different tissues, that it had about half the amount of CBP protein produced because there was only half the amount of appropriate genes that would have been there. Now what we found out, this was interesting, these are wild type mice, we call them wild type because they're normal, and then our CBP mice, um, they had several phenotypic um, differences. Um, the CBP mice were small. They were so cute. They never really grew to, grew, grew to adult size. You just wanted to sit there and pet them. They were so cute. Um, they also um, had uh, curvature to their spine. They um, had problems. They would have seizures sometime, sometimes. Um, and they often died very early um, in life. Um, usually a normal lifespan for a mouse is between two years. It's around two years. They live much longer. Um, they usually die of a cancer of some sort. And so about two years old. And these mice, their lifespan, um, most of them die before a year, about a year. Now, if there was no copy of CBP, the mouse never survived. It actually died as an embryo. And so we never had um, uh, live offspring if they didn't have any CBP. Uh, CBP is a really important protein. CBP is a gene, and it codes for a protein. And the protein has many important functions, and I've listed them out here. It's essential. Obviously, if there's none of it, no life, right? And so it's really important. It's important in basic transcription. It's a cofactor or a co-repressor, depending on what gene is being expressed. It's important in transcription. And it also has an important role in acetylene. This is adding an acetyl group onto histones and proteins. Sometimes proteins have to, have, have to be modified to be able to perform their function. And this is one way they can be modified. And CBP is important for doing that for many important proteins. I see you way at the top, Ariana. What's, what's CBP? CBP is the same as CREB BP. No, it's a gene. It's a gene that codes for a protein, yeah. And so the protein is what performs the function, right? And so its functions are here. And um, another function it has is in opening up the chromatin structure. Whenever histones get acetylated, um, they tend to open up the chromatin structure so that we can, the machinery for transcription can easily access the DNA. And so overall, it's an important um, component in the cell. If it's not there, the cell, I mean, the, the uh, organism dies. And if it's at lower levels, there's lots of problems. Okay. Now, one thing we noticed was this, these mice die early. What did they die from is what we were curious about. And what they died from is, and I'll put it up here, AML, a leukemia. So if they were um, younger, we would say that their hemopoietic system, their blood system, was normal. And I put this in parentheses uh, because they weren't normal mice, but their hemopoietic system was normal. They had skeletal problems. Um, sometimes they had seizures. But they had a normal hemopoietic system early on. Okay. And then if they were over the age of 12, and sometimes it took them a while before they would develop AML, uh, but they, uh, most of them developed um, AML, which is a, a leukemia. 
And so what we wanted to know was what happened here? In between them being relatively normal and then them getting leukemia, was there something else happening? And what I wanted to know was, did MDS precede the AML? And MDS, remember, is a pre-leukemic disease or disorder. Okay, so if it was, we'd expect it to occur in between the period where it was normal to where it actually developed the AML. And in fact, it was a good model, and I'll tell you the evidence for that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the CBP mice at this specific age uh, we wanted to see, were they a good model for MDS? And so first we had to look at, was there dysplasia? Was there inappropriate development in the blood cells? And if any of you have taken um, AMP or maybe even micro and later, um, later in micro, uh, you may have looked at blood cells under the microscope. Um, this is a normal neutrophil. It has Usually normal neutrophils have about four lobes to their nucleus, so their nucleus is in a big nice circle. It actually has lobes to it, but they're all connected together, so it's just really one nucleus. So here's a normal neutrophil, and it has about four, maybe about five, um, lobes to its nucleus. Here we have um, a neutrophil that is hyperlobulated, which means it does not have the appropriate numbers. It has way too many lobes to its nucleus. And this is one sign that your, your mature blood cells are not um, maturing appropriately. They're not developing correctly. Okay. Now we saw many um, other signs of this, and so we had this looked at by a pathologist, by a histolo uh, uh, histologist and a pathologist, and they confirmed that this was sufficient enough to, uh, to um, diagnose these mice as having MDS was nice. Now another thing that we found was that the number of hemopoietic stem cells that we found in their bone marrow was decreased, which was similar to what we find in human MDS. The number of hemopoietic stem cells decreases, meaning they don't produce appropriate numbers of mature cells. And then another characteristic I found, and this is using a very uh, um, sophisticated technique which looks at the protein levels, um, which are found on neutrophils. Uh, MAC1 and GR1 are two proteins, surface proteins, that are found on neutrophils. And these would be the cells that are negative. This is using flow cytometry. Uh, these are the cells that would be negative for both. These would be positive for MAC1 on their surface. These would be positive only for GR1 on their surface. And then these cells are positive for both MAC1 and GR1. Now, MAC1 and GR1 are found both on neutrophils, so we know that these cells are neutrophils. And so we compared the number of neutrophils in our wild-type mouse, the mouse that has two copies of CBP and no problems, uh, to the, our CBP mouse that has only one copy of uh, the CBP gene. And what we found was the number of neutrophils was significantly increased. It was like blowing out the rest of the populations. So there'd be a lot of neutrophils, not a lot of B and T cells, which are important for fighting infections. And so in addition to finding dysplasia, we also found an increase in this population, which we, we refer to as a myeloid population. So I said increased myelopoiesis, which is the production of myeloid cells. And so what we actually characterized the mice as having, what disease, was an MDS NPN. An NPN stands for myeloproliferative neoplasm. And so in addition to having MPS, this poor little mouse has way too many myeloid cells being produced as well. And this is, this is a, a subtype of MDS. We said MDS is a heterogeneous pool, and this is just one of the subtypes. And so we showed um, in a paper that I, I wrote, oh, yay, that's me, Zimmer. That's my maiden name. Um, we showed that, in fact, this was a good model for MDS. OK, breathe. Whew. OK, so we have a model. Now what I wanted to know was, was the microenvironment playing a role in the development of the MDS? Now, the MDS develops from blood cells. But I wanted to know, does the cells that influence the blood cells play a role? OK, so here we have a hemopoietic stem cell. 
This could also be a mature cell or a, a progenitor cell here. It's influenced by other cells around it, right? We would like to think of it as our, you're a cell, you're a cell, you're a cell. Now, you make your own decisions, right? But you're influenced by your family and you're influenced by your friends, right? And so ultimately, you are influenced, your decisions are influenced by the uh, people around you, okay? And so what, I, what this is depicting here is in the bone marrow, the hemopoietic stem cell, it's influenced by several groups of cells. Osteoblasts influence hemopoietic stem cells. If you, have, if you deplete the osteoblasts, you just get rid of osteoblasts in the bone marrow, the number of stem cells drops like crazy, almost to nothing. Um, neurons are important. Uh, mesenchymal stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells are a type of stem cell that gives rise to um, osteoblasts and adipocytes um, and uh, chondrocytes has a role. If you get rid of, rid of mesenchymal stem cells, hemopoietic stem cells numbers also drop. Um, osteoclasts have also played a role in adipocytes. And so um, realize a cell is influenced by other cells. Now we wanted to investigate a group of, of different types of cells, the ones that had been shown to play the most important role in regulating blood cells or hemopoietic stem cells. So we looked at these four groups. Oh, I didn't say endothelial cells. Does anybody know what endothelial cells are? What do they line? They're an, a type of epithelial cell. They line the blood vessels, okay? And so uh, blood vessels are everywhere, right? And one place they are definitely located is in your bone marrow. And so we looked at these different types of cells to see, hey, are they altered in the CBP mice? that develop MDS. And I'll show you a little bit of evidence about that. So what we, one of the, the uh, things that we noticed about the mice from the very beginning was that they were, uh, well, how you have to get bone marrow out. You isolate a femur from a poor little mouse, and you cut the ends off, and then you stick a needle in the end, and you flush out the bone marrow. And in that process of getting bone marrow, I noticed that when I put my tweezers on the femur of a CPP mouse, often I crushed the femur. And on a wild type mouse, it uh, had no problem, right? The bone was much stronger. And so we wanted to look at the bone and see what was wrong with it. And in fact, what we did see differences, this is the number of uh, spongy bone, right? Here we can see the, the measurement for spongy bone in circles here, or in triangles here. Whatever these are, rectangles, there we go. <laughs> I know my shapes, right? Okay. So here we have the spongy bone that is highlighted for our wild type mice and our spongy bone for our CBP mice. And what we'll see is the red or the pink color is much less in the CBP mice than in the wild type mice. So it signified that there was, first off, there was something wrong with the bone. Now my AMP students should know what are the two major types of cells in the bone? Osteoblasts, yes, osteoblasts, yeah, okay, good, they paid attention. So osteoblasts are a major part of the bone, right? They are contributing to bone formation, and so we wanted to look at the number of osteoblasts. Well, sadly, we found no difference in the number of osteoblasts. Okay, so we found no difference in the number of osteoblasts. Well, one thing we did find a difference in was the number of mesenchymal stem cells. Well, mesenchymal stem cells are stem cells that give rise to osteoblasts, they also give rise to chondrocytes, and they give rise to adipocytes. We found that in the bone marrow, the number of these cells was dramatically decreased. Now, it may be that at the point that we looked, we couldn't catch a difference between the number of osteoblasts. But in fact, maybe there was, we just didn't catch it at the correct time point, which often happens um, in science. But um, does anybody know another cell that's important for bone uh, growth and breakdown? Osteoclast, yes, okay. And so we also looked at osteoclast number. And what we found in comparison that there was a significant increase in the number of osteoclasts that were produced. Now osteoclasts chew up bone because they're macrophages and they, um, they were significantly increased, which could attribute to the a decreased amount of bone that was found in the CBP mice. Okay, so we saw first off there were differences in some microenvironment cells. There were some differences in mesenchymal stem cells, some differences in osteoclasts. So we looked at our last type of cell, 
which were endothelial cells. And we did this huge experiment. We were counting the number of endothelial cells, looking at vasculature. And we found no difference in the number of endothelial cells. But when we looked closer and we looked at the amount of protein that was produced on different endothelial cells, those from wild type, which is in white, and those from CBP, which is in, in red, we no noticed that the abundance of certain types of proteins were higher on CBP uh, endothelial cells compared to wild type. So I'll go over this image so it makes sense. This is also looking at uh, expression level of proteins. So these are two surface uh, proteins that are produced on endothelial cells. And what we found was, and this is the abundance of the protein, when we looked at that from wild type or that on CBP endothelial cells, we found that ESAM, which is a protein, was found in more abundance than what was on wild type endothelial cells. We found the same thing for another important protein, which is cadherin-5. Now, we didn't understand the significance of this. We just noticed that there were differences in the uh, endothelial cells, in the mesenchymal stem cells, and in the osteoclasts of these mice. So did it have a consequence is what we really cared about. Does it have a consequence in the fact that these are, these are altered? And so we did a mouse experiment. Okay. Fun stuff. And so what we did was a bone marrow transplantation experiment on little tiny mice, which is really hard to do. <laughs> And so what we did is we wanted to know if we took a wild type mouse, which has a normal environment, no problems with it, inside the bone marrow, all of its cells are normal. It has two copies of the CBP, so everything's fine. And if we put it into a mouse that only had one copy of CBP, that means its microenvironment was altered, it had problems. We wanted to know if we put wild type blood cells in, was there a difference at the end? So we took wild type cells and we were gonna inject them into wild type mice and take wild type cells and inject them into CBP mice. Are we following me? Okay, and what we wanted to look at at the end was, what's wrong with, is there something wrong with the blood? Do they have MDS? Or do they have MPN? What's going on? And so we looked at the wild type cells in the wild type mouse, and we looked at the wild type cells in the CBP mouse, and tried to identify if there was a difference. Now, dun dun dun, of course we found, no, no, we did, we did find a difference. And so here is the big hierarchy of the hemopoietic system. Right, we have hemopoietic stem cells here, and our mature cells down at the end. And the type of mature cells we talked about earlier were neutrophils. Okay. Now, along the way, uh, hemopoietic stem cells produce maturer cells, but not absolutely mature cells, which are called progenitors. And then we have our absolutely mature blood cells at the end. And so we looked at each one of these populations to see where they altered, where they increased or decreased with something wrong. What we found were our hemopoietic stem cells were decreased, which was similar to what we found in the diseased mouse at the beginning. We also found that the progenitors were decreased, which kind of makes sense if the stem cells decreased, it can't produce as many progenitors, and it can't produce as many mature cells. And so the B and T cells at the very end were significantly reduced. Now, B and T cells are important for fighting infection. These mice often died because they had an infection. Then we looked at um, our other side of the pool, which are myeloid cells. We saw the progenitors for the myeloid cells were decreased, but surprisingly, as we moved closer and closer to the mature cells, we saw an increase. Basically, our, um, our stem cell pool and our progenitor pool was being completely put out because it was pushing and pushing and being pushed to produce all of these mature myeloid cells. And so this is reminiscent of NPN, the initials I wrote over here. And now what I highlighted here were the exact uh, similarities that we found in the normal, in the CBP mice that had no transplantation. We found these same problems. Okay, 
So basically what we showed was that regardless of what type of hemopoietic cell you put in, normal, diseased, didn't matter, the environment was what caused this phenotype in the blood, which is kind of scary. I don't know if you're scared. I, I'd be scared. Uh, <laughs> which basically means that if you treat the hemopoietic cells and you potentially cure whatever disease it is, the environment is still altered. It can cause the wild type cells to change again, right? Which, is a, which is, would be a horrible thing. And so this is my overall conclusions that I had come to, which was that the bone marrow microenvironment contributes to the phenotype that we saw originally in the CBP uh, mouse that had only half of the dose or half of the uh, copy of the CBP gene. And when we, found, when we looked at the bone marrow microenvironment specifically, we found many components, cellular components were altered. We saw alterations in the mesenchymal stem cells, and the endothelial cells, and the osteoclasts. We assumed that all of these were playing a role in contributing to the CBP mouse um, phenotype at the beginning. Okay, now that took no time to describe. It took a lot of time to do. Um, it took about five and a half years for all of that research. Now, I didn't show you everything, <laughs> but um, a lot of transplantation experiments, a lot of working with mouse, mice. But then the, I started to think about some additional questions that I was um, pondering, which were, now chemicals that we, um, we know cause MDS, like benzene, or chemotherapy agents, right? Do they change the microenvironment too? Is that ultimately what they're doing, changing the environment and causing the hemopoietic cells to become diseased? Or are they changing the hemopoietic cells themselves? And so this is an important thing that not, is not being investigated yet. And there are um, two major types of chemicals that, that can be investigated, which are therapy-related MDS uh, chemicals, like the chemotherapies. Right, or environmental care, uh, chemicals that we don't necessarily know a lot about, like benzene. Do we, we know it causes MDS, but how? Does it actually change the microenvironment, or does it change the cells first? Right? And then also an important thing to, to think about is whenever you treat somebody for MDS, are you harming the environment, the bone marrow microenvironment? Because if you are, it's not a good thing. Right? Just because you're curing the MDS and you're hurting something else, right? That's not a good thing. You want to benefit both without um, making any sort of uh, harmful contributions to the environment. Now, um, kind of leading this way and looking into the future and um, seeing how these tests, how these um, questions could potentially be answered. So here I put this list of uh, chemicals. Um, acetylating agents are a type of chemotherapy that are used. Um, HDAC inhibitors are a type of uh, chemotherapy that, that are used. And benzene, all of these have been linked to MDS development. And if we tested them and saw, hey, let's treat all of the bone marrow and microenvironment cells with these chemicals and see if they are altered. Do they have problems once they have been treated? We can look at several different things, right? Looking at their morphology, do their, does their cell shape change? Do they stop growing like they normally would? Do they die, right? Does their gene expression change? They stop producing certain proteins that are important. Is their DNA damaged, right? And, and most importantly, are they not able to support normal hemopoiesis? So if we injure them with a chemical, does it ultimately disrupt their function? Okay, that was a lot. I overwhelmed you, I bet. So are there any questions? And this is my neutrophil that's happy. <laughs> yes, right. You said that you took the wild type and inserted it into the CBP and then that changed, or they got changed towards the environment. Did you ever do it backwards to see if you can insert CBP into wild type and then get better? Yeah, so CBP cells are bad, we know that. So if you take CBP hemopoietic cells, they're bad. 
We put them into wild type mice and they also develop the disease. So it seems like if you take the cells, the hemopoietic cells and put them into mice, they're diseased. If you take wild type cells and put them into a CBP mice, mouse, they're diseased. So the hemopoietic cells and the environment in these mice have a problem, both of them actually. And that was a completely different graduate student who did that work, but yeah, that was, that was something we wanted to determine. So how do you explain that then? <laughs> that it's not only one or the other, it's both of them together, right? And so we didn't see the exact same, so let me just talk it through a little bit. So here are my CBP mice, and if we just put uh, wild type cells in the CBP mouse, they only developed AML, only leukemia, never MDS first. And if we put CBP cells, um, or kept them in their CBP environment, they developed MDS, NPN, and then leukemia. If we took CBP, let me put it here so I have it, into wild type, CBP into CBP, or if we put CBP, yeah, wild type, into CBP mice, then they only developed in PN. So all of them together had to be there for the actual disease that we saw in the original mouse to occur. And so, as you know, you are a factor of yourself and the people around you, and that's exactly the way for this disease. It's not only the hemopoietic cells, but it's the cells around them. And so, one of them may be enough to cause the disease, and two of them together cause an even more robust disease. Any other questions? Yes, what Dr. Lee. What does MPN stand for? Uh, Myeloproliferative neoplasm. And is it, it's not the same as, it is a different type of neoplasm than AML, or? Yes. Um, so it's actually, this, com this confuses a lot of people. Neoplasm, it's actually not a cancer even though neoplasm is often used as a substitute name for cancer. It's not a cancer. Um, it often develops into AML as well. But MDS has many subtypes. One subtype is MDS that also has MPN in it. And so this is just one type of MDS. Can you spell that? <laughs> spell that, sure. Sure. Now you're going to see if I can spell Milo Neoplasm. Neoplasm. The longest word, yes. And that's why we abbreviate it NPN. So um, this just means bone marrow, right? High proliferation of myeloid cells, specific type of myeloid cell in the bone marrow. And so we saw a huge push for myeloid cells to be produced. And so in addition to the phenotype you normally see with MDS, so it's kind of like a little extra boost to it. Yes, Dr. Grove. So if you saw an increase in tenure, right, does that mean that you're looking at adhesion molecules and other Often. cells are interacting with each other through adhesion molecules? Absolutely. So one thing we know about hemopoietic stem cells is that adhesion is important. Um, for a hemopoietic stem cell to uh, function appropriately, it needs to adhere to specific types of cells. And so if it was increased, and that's what we always look at, cytokines that are expressed in adhesion molecules. Those are the first easy way that something could be altered. And so um, we know that adhesion is important. We don't always know what molecules. So we kind of took this huge array of um, adhesion molecules and looked at them. I only showed you two, but almost every adhesion molecule we found for endothelial cells was elevated, which is really uh, kind of bizarre. Uh, we didn't expect that. We thought maybe some would be elevated, not all of them. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Levens. How is it uh, that chemotherapeutic agents that are used for other cancers can cause or associated at least with the development of MDS, and then when they develop M uh, this type of leukemia, will these patients respond to chemotherapy? Uh, that's a great question. 
Um, and so chemotherapy agents, often what they do to kill cancer cells is they target the DNA and damage it. And so they damage the cancer cell's DNA, but there's always a chance that they're going to damage normal cell's DNA. And so they are also damaging normal cell's DNA, and that's the consequence. That's the consequence of, of chemotherapy treatments in general. Radiation is another cause. It also damages normal cells too. Um, so I'll get to you, Dr. Scores, in just a second. Let me answer a second question. Now, Often, if, they're going, if they develop an AML, they have to be treated by a different uh, chemotherapy agent. Um, often, when they develop um, MDS, it's not because they had an AML at the beginning. It was a different type of cancer that they were treated with, uh, they were treated for, and then they just developed a hemopoietic disease from that. Yeah. But the hemopoietic system divides like crazy, and so it's an easy target. It's an easy target for a chemotherapy agent. Yes, Dr. Suarez. How did your research find you, Dr. Suarez? Was it NIH or the Leukemia Society? Or? It was a lot of a little bit of everything. <laughs> it was funded um, under an NIH grant, um, which is a federal grant. Um, so that my, my mentor got money from the government, and this was funded partially by that. Um, I also got um, partial from other small societies. Um, but it was mostly NIH. Well, I'd just like to comment to the different clubs and societies. One of the best fundraisers for the Leukemia Society is the Rock and Roll Marathon. Yes, that's true. And if you get up a team, one of our former students is one of the coaches that worked for the Leukemia Society. The Leukemia Society has raised millions and millions of dollars for this kind of research. And it's a fun thing that we have clubs to do. We put together a team. You don't have to run the whole marathon, but yeah, I'm I'm hoping to maybe start that next year, having a group who kind of I'm the leader. I'll join y'all join me, and we go <laughs> and we go run, and y'all will beat me because I'm slow. But um, at least we are participating and, and contributing right our part um, to development of research. Yes. develop leukemia, yeah, if they survive, the, if they survive the MDS. Yes? So you're saying a normal healthy person that exposed radiation can develop leukemia? Correct. How well, they can develop cancer. That's one of the scariest parts. Well, how much radiation would you say that exposure was? Because my dad died from this, prostate cancer, and skin cancer. So now I'm wondering if he got it from his initial radiation exposure or from when he went to chemotherapy and he got his prostate cancer. Um, we're, we don't always know the answers, sadly. Um, usually what we try and do when we treat a cancer with radiation, we try to do targeted treatment in a specific area, not whole body radiation. If you did whole body radiation, um, the person would die, right? They would just be too intense. And so we try and do targeted. So if there's a tumor in the brain, you target it only in the brain. So hopefully the rest of the body is not exposed to any of that irradiation. And so often, if you see that they were treated in a brain area uh, and they developed you know, cancer somewhere else, like the skin on their foot, then it wasn't probably related. No. Any other questions? All right. All right. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.